It is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Mark Siemens. Mark is Dean of Physical Sciences, Distinguished Professor and Chancellor's Associate's Chair in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at the University of California, San Diego. He has spent his career studying isotopic composition, particularly in meteorites. He made fundamental contributions to the quantum mechanical understanding of isotope decay, providing the foundation for new theories of isotopic, re <coughs> isotopic reaction mechanisms that have led to a deeper understanding of the Earth's atmospheric composition, the Earth's evolution, and atmosphere surface interactions on Earth and Mars, among other things. His own studies have provided value, valuable insights into an unusually wide variety of phenomena, ranging from ozone chemistry and global temperature change to the nature and dynamics of Mars and its atmospheres and the prospects for life there. Mark is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Geophysical Union, the Geochemical Society, the European Association for Geochemistry, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Among many awards, he was named an Albert Einstein Professor by the Chinese Academy of Sciences and has been awarded the Alexander von Humboldt Award twice, the Ernest O. Lawrence Award of the Department of Energy, and the Goldschmidt Medal of the Geochemical Society. Perhaps the most emblematic honor and the most physically tangible one is the naming of asteroid 7004 Mark Thiemens in his honor. Mark earned a BS at the University of Miami and an MS and a PhD in oceanography at Old Dominion University and Florida State University, respectively. His talk tonight is entitled Isotopes, Magic Keys to Understanding Life and the Cosmos. Please hold questions to the end and join me in welcoming Mark to the podium. I've got her. Uh, I can hear it. Larry, Larry, thank you very much for the invitation to come here. It's an honor. I've always wanted to come here and spend a little time, and it's and it's a nicer organization than I even imagined it would be. So it's a pleasure to come here, and, and I very much appreciate it. It's a fantastic place and a, and a rich history, and I, I enjoyed your 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 comments. And I'll try to live up to your expectations and entertain people. I hope everyone had a good dinner and tailgated or something so that you'll enjoy the evening. And uh, So I, I thought a little bit about what's the best way to approach the talk. I'll obviously tell you a little bit about what I do, but a little bit about the process of, since it's a philosophical group, how do you think about problems? And then how do, when you think about a problem, how do you go about solving it? And how do you find a way to find a solution to a problem that's that's a little bit difficult or unusual or large. So part of it is, it's so it'll be a little bit of a travel log in a way from that way because there's the answers to finding these questions or to these questions are sometimes found in strange places. So that's my goal in this and I thought about it a while how I would do this and how I start before I take a chunk out of this and most of all how do I do it that it's fun. Did you get something out of it that you have a million questions at the end to say, Mark, but what about this? Um, so, and I'm going to do it to scale. I'm going to start big and I'm going to go small. The only thing, and I'm not going to, you know, I'm a professor of chemistry and a background in physics. I'm not going to do, you'll be sorry to hear that there won't be equations. A chemistry lecture. I know that's what you came for and I apologize, but it won't be anything. I'm going to try to make the concepts come across clear, but without too much razzle-dazzle, and then so that we can think about the problems themselves. And I'll also tell you where, where, the, end, where, the, where the wall is. This is where I don't understand it anymore. And that's always the interesting point, is to figure out where the wall is. So the trick I use, is, as Larry said, is in isotopes. And all you really need to know, I put this up on purpose. I, I do this because... Make sure. Yeah. So just to represent, all an isotope is the same element, but it weighs different. 
So if you add a neutron on it, it makes it a little heavier, and it behaves differently. So it's a character modifier. And by those modifications, if you can measure it, one, that's a hard part. Two, if you understand the physical laws, then you can see how it's changed and interpreted. So it's a little like psychology. You know, you can see the behavior, you know some fundamental laws and some fundamental biochemistry, and you can put together something about what's happening or why was this behavior that way. So I try to understand the behavior of things to interpret things widely put. And it's the things that I'll talk about. I use the same trick all the way through in measuring things, but I'm not really going to talk so much about the tricks as the stuff, because the stuff is going to be more interesting. So now, I'll, here we go. So we start in the beginning, right? The Big Bang. And this is pretty well known these days. And there's a lot that's been known, and a lot of my colleagues work on this. It starts about, say, 13 to 14 billion years ago. And the universe blows up. There's a lot of ways of knowing when and how it blew up and what this, what's left over from it that people measure. And then it expands out in space and time, and that's what you, you use the laws of general and special relativity to understand. My slice of this comes in somewhere around in here, about five billion years ago. All right, so in that point in time, then we're, then we're talking about our own home, the galaxy, and our sun and the planets lives out here. It's about 100 light years across, and this rotates about every 100 million years. So part of what I try to do in this world is understand what, how did this form and what's left over from it that I can understand. Because then when you understand that, then you can Google down and understand some of the things that came along with that, such as the, the smaller things in this scale, like the origin of life and whatnot. So I like this quote, and I used it because you have a picture of Mark Twain. I'm named after Mark Twain, and his picture is in your billiard room. So I thought I... And I like this quote. It says, it's amazing what you can find out by finding out. And I like that, because if you're curious and keep trying to find out, you find out. And you find out things that you didn't know that you could find out. So it's a great quote. And so at the beginning, we look at elements. And, and the only thing to take with this is when you look at them, you have this little jaggedy pattern here. And one of, two of my colleagues in the department figured this out in around 1947, and it's an important observation. It's actually a really important observation. If you apply all the laws of chemistry, you can't understand this. And it's because of how it's, a, it's a nuclear physics effect. You can only explain this by nuclear physics. Okay, that's not so exciting, but what does it mean? It means all the elements were made in stars, except for these guys down here that were made in the Big Bang. All these are made in stars. That was a big deal. Before 1947, you had to do it, know it. But Seuss, who, not Cat in the Hat, but Dr. Seuss, who was a fellow that I work with, both of them lived in La Jolla, so it was entirely confusing. And they were both sort of strange characters. But figured out that this happened. And that was a big deal to figure out that the elements where they came from. And, uh, and it wasn't known. The other person... There's a gentleman named Murray who won the Nobel Prize in, in chemistry. And if you don't know him, the next time you come into your, your dining room where the Nobel Prize winners are, if you look to the left door, his picture is right there. Those two people figured it out. And that was a big discovery. And so now you try to figure out where does it come from, and it comes from stars. So part of what we do is try to understand the internal working of stars. But the way you figure out what happens inside of stars that makes these elements, which makes the solar systems, which makes the universe, how these work, you can't go to stars. You can see them spectroscopically, but you can't see anything satisfying, right? It's like jello for dessert. You're temporarily full, but then you realize I didn't eat anything. It was just jello. So it's a little bit like a jello dessert. You don't get anything out of it. So to really figure it out, you get it at the isotope level, because that's where all the action shows up that you can fingerprint how the stars work. But the trick is doing that. And the way you do that is after they're formed, mostly in blowing up stars and some in the regular stars, and they end up in the solar system. But where they end up in is meteorites. See, meteorites form. The Earth isn't very good for seeing old stuff because it's all messed up. Right, you've got an ocean, and the ocean's the death of everything. 
And it just washes everything around, and over the course of a billion years, everything's been homogenized. It's interesting at the, ge at the John Powell level, right, because everything's sorted out geologically, and it's fun as a geologist, but if you want to understand the origins, you can't. It's all gone. The moon's a mess, and it's part of the Earth, so that doesn't help you. Mars, Mars we'll talk about. But the meteorites formed, and they stopped, right? They, they stopped forming early on. Some... I mean, my wife occasionally accuses me of being that way. You know, so I sort of farmed early and then it stopped way too early and it didn't evolve from there. And that, that's actually not untrue. But in the meteorites, some of them have organic material in. So they have things like amino acids. All right, so part of the puzzle is going to be sorting that out because the origin of life is tied up there. Part of them are interiors of planets and some of the meteorites are Mars. So you've got a lot of, you got a lot of books to look at. Right, you've got everything recorded here, but the trick is to interpret it. You find it's part of what we do, and I want to talk about it, is interstellar grains. When a star blows up, you condense things right away. Well, I don't do it, the stars do it, but it condenses, and these little grains stay, and they get swept up in this material. So what you find in these are these little interstellar grains that are from other stars. And so what you do is astrophysics, but looking at these grains, and you can see seven or eight different types of stars that have blown up and made this, these interstellar grains. So it's honest to God, stardust. And we can measure it. And so that gives you some hint at what's out there and how stars work. But part of what you're after is how do the organics get made? Because somehow you've got to figure this out if you're going to figure out how the Earth was formed and how life was formed. Now part of the record that you look at, and this is just a picture, forget about what it means, but part of what this, part of the way the isotope world is, you understand the laws, but after that it's pattern recognition. Right? It's like TSA at the airport. They look for certain patterns of behavior sometimes because, so in the isotopes, you look for a pattern. If you understand what's behind it, you learn something. So if you look at a pattern in these inclusions, part of what they do, these are from a meteorite. These are the oldest objects in the solar system that have formed are 4.6 billion years old. And looking at these, you get a record of what happened when you made the planets and all the rocks in the solar system. But there was always a theory that this had to be coming from stars that blew up based on that you, how you produce this pattern. And one of the things that we do in trying to do this, we found that the same pattern gets made by a chemical process, which means this theories are for 20 years ago came about from a chemical process. So the planets weren't formed by triggering it with a concussion from a blowing up star, which was a, sort of the legacy for 20, 30, 40 years. But it's more, but it's, it results from a chemical process that you can interpret from the isotopes. The problem with it when we found this is it turns out to be a very nasty problem in quantum mechanics. And so you have to sort through a lot of very difficult stuff that for a very few strange people, we enjoy doing it. But the problem is, is that it's difficult, and it always reminds me of this. This is a famous quote from Richard Feynman, that no one really understands quantum mechanics. It's probably right. Every time you think you understand it, it slips away, and you say, wait a minute, I don't get this. What the, what the heck is this? And so this is the picture of Garrett Cole, if you've seen this picture. I think it's, 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 in, it's in the museum. And I thought this picture was titled Insane, so I used this, and I just realized that it's not a because that's what happens when you think about this too much. But it's actually, it's a, the title of this is Portrait of a Kleptomaniac, so it's no longer appropriate. But the expression still is re relevant, but the title no longer is. So I get partial credit, but that's all. Now part of the thing that you want to work on is what's the role of this? So now we've got the stuff, we've got stardust, and we're forming planets. But if you want to figure out how everything goes, you have to understand what the role of the sun is. Because if the sun plays a role in it, it's a whole different can of worms. You won't, then you have to worry with what's called photochemistry. And that's a whole different... Normal chemistry is okay. A lot of the rules are sorted out. But photochemistry is fast and it, and it runs into different rules. So you have to sort out the photochemistry. But the rules for all the relevant things take place in, in an energy spectrum that's a pain to work with. It's very short ultraviolet light that comes out of the sun early on that does this. So if you want to do the experiments, you can't do them with lasers and things in the lab that are handy. You have to go 
to big machines. So this is where we do part of the work of studying it with a synchrotron. So to give you a size at a scale, this is in the Republic of Berkeley. So you can see, you can see all the important things, the Golden Gate, San Francisco, most importantly of all, there's Alcatraz. And, and then here's, here's the synchrotron. So here's the, here's the machine to give you a size. So here's a car, right? So that's the size of the machine. And we put our instruments in there and we work off of this big machine to get this ultraviolet light. So basically we're looking at the stellar radiation like the sun is early on to try to sort these laws out. And it turns out that the role of the sun is important and we can mimic it. And from the understanding the pattern, we realize now that the sun is an important player in this whole process. That's important when you get down towards understanding the origin of life. But if you want to understand it, you got to understand the sun. So here's a hard one. You really would like to know what the sun's made out of. And you'd like to know the isotope composition because you want to interpret the meteorites because that gives you the early solar system. So early solar system and then meteorites and then the sun. But what you need is a sample of the sun, right? That's what you need. All right, it's been tried before. This is a picture of Icarus, right? It doesn't work. You know what happens. You get up there, you get high enough, blam, you melt, and there you come back to Earth and it's... That's the end of it. So we, we wrote a proposal. It was called Seuss Jury. It got turned down, and it's called Genesis. It went out halfway gravitationally to the sun for two years, stood out there collecting on this, this, um, this system here. This is it here. It's like, a, it's like an old jukebox where the rate... Actually, you probably, sometimes I give this talk to a group of 18-year-olds, and I say jukebox, and they say, what? I say, well, it's what you put records in. I say, what? You know, so so it's like an old jukebox where the radio where the where they come out and it lays in the sun and collects the sun coming out. Problem is, and then it comes back to Earth and you recover it. The problem is, it crashed. The parachute didn't open. Now you'll see later. This was Jet Propulsion Lab. Those of you who work with them, they wired in the switch wrong, so this came to the Earth. The bad part was it was filmed all the way in by CNN. CNN. So it was on the news for like every 10 minutes for three days. And then my friends never asked me, Mark, how's your research going? But now all of a sudden, Mark, was that yours? Yes, thank you for asking. <laughs> my friends are great, you know, they don't ask. So it crashed, but we were able to recover it. And now the problem is, is that, that you have to build a new instrument to get it, because you only get a nanogram of material of the sun, but we have it. We assured NASA that we would be able to measure that. I had no clue how we were going to measure it when it flew. But I figured by the time the thing went out and come back, I'd figure it out. And we did. So it's a big laser system that evaporates the silicon carbide, and the sun is in here, on a, in, implanted, and it comes out and it goes into a machine here. And it actually works, and it can do it. And so we've requested the samples, because I had to prove that we can do it, and we finally have done it. And so now what we're able to see is that the early sun has played a big role in the formation of the molecules that end up on top of planets. And so that allows us to get into understanding at the planet level. And now that we've gotten into this, we suddenly started finding some things that are interesting in the planet itself. So now it leads you to chase the right rabbit down the hole. And you know, you're all, that always gets really adventurous, but you run into all sorts of problems. There's all these strange people underground here with decks of cards and what have you. So we've chased the white rabbit down the hole, and now we're getting a little closer in. And so what we want to do is take those same tricks to understand life on Earth and its fragility. Right? This is the atmosphere of the Earth. This is the whole thing. Right? This, this is a good perspective on it, because here, you are, here we all are, but everything is in this tiny little band. It's a good perspective, because you always get the feeling, well, it's an infinite reservoir. We can do anything we want. And won't mess it up, but it's not true. It's thin. You see, so to try to understand it, so the next goal in coming down to putting these pieces together is to understand what happens in this thin layer and how it relates to everything else. But the problem with that is a lot of the interesting things happen up in the top of the atmosphere as it leaks to space. And the problem with the top of the atmosphere is that it's at the top of the atmosphere. And I used to fly stratospheric balloons, and, and they get you up into here, but not up into here. And they're painful. If you ever fl they're, they're, they never work. 
They crash, and the worst part is you have to spend like a month in Palestine, Texas to wait till you can fly. And you can't get up where all the action is. So he converted over and got into the rocket business, and I'm getting ready as I get back, get out of administrative things and putting in the proposals to get back into this. But it's a simple system. Those of you who remember the 50s remember Nike rockets. Well, that's what this is, and this is an Orion. And then I put a payload in here that's able to sample over altitudes. And it looks like this. This is the picture taken, the guy's taking a picture of the bolt to show that he's taking it out. So if it blows up, it's not his fault, it's this guy's fault here. And so that's what it is. And then and then you load it up and it's, and you're and the systems here. This and here's the cone. So this is when it's all done, you know, everybody's out and this thing rolls back and then it lifts up to fly. Then the only person who's expendable pulls out these red flags that arms the plastic explosives. And I always remind my colleagues, I'm a dean, right? So deans are not known for being friendly people. Normal deans are just grumpy old people. But I remind them, listen, I'm the only one on this campus that has a plastic explosives license to handle it. And so this is armed with plastic explosives that blows off the nose cone at the right place and then begins the sampling. And it comes back. It goes like this. <clears throat> gets in the stratosphere in about seven or eight seconds, and it samples the upper atmosphere, turns around, the parachutes. Now, you remember Genesis and that thing crashing? This is my parachute. My parachute opens. We pack our own parachute. These guys, the jet propulsion guys, so we do our own. This is a picture coming out. So this is what's left of it. I go out in a helicopter, take this, put it in, throw it in a helicopter, and, and then bring it back to La Jolla and measure it. So what we've learned... And this is going to get, this is an important puzzle for the origin of life. I know it seems weird, but, but what we learn is that you see ozone's labeled, it's spiked. It's got a funny isotope composition. So when it interacts with people, meaning other molecules, it leaves its record. And ozone runs the whole atmosphere, right? It's, it makes radicals. The radicals that it makes are the ones when you're talking about antioxidants. That's what it wants to kill, is the one that comes from ozone. That's the one that does all the damage to it. It does it all up here, but it's the radical that does the chemistry. So we've been able to understand the record of ozone, but ozone's a big player in the climate story, too, and the atmosphere and how it works. So we learn from this that all the action on this shows up in this. And with that, we learn a lot about global primary productivity, and looking at a record of, of how primary productivity works on Earth. But there's something really interesting here, and it, and it gets right in it. I'm always looking for an excuse to do this next part, so this is my favorite part. This is what I like ever since I was a kid, which, you know, I, I'm older in age, but not, not this way. You know, I'm still living that world. But, but what I like, carbon dioxide, if some of you know this already, but in a solar system, there's another place that has all carbon dioxide. It's called Mars. So the thing is, if this funny record is showing up here, the Mars atmosphere is the same thing. It has this and this. So if I can get a Mars meteorite, maybe I can understand something about the surface of Mars and what's going on. Plus, the meteorites from Mars vary in age by two and a half to three billion years. She got little snapshots of what happened on the atmosphere of Mars. And that's a big deal. So, so we applied it to Mars. This is just sort of like a warning. If you're going to work on Mars, you have to be worried about it because it's a dangerous place. So if you ever think about going and working on Mars, talk to me first because I have experience with these things. This is my picture of one of, one of my trips to get Mars meteorites. So this is a Mars meteorite. This is the famous one. This is the one that you heard about some 15 years ago, where they reported life on Mars. And this is what they reported. So it looks pretty cool. This is what it was. Well, it's made of calcium carbonate. Carbonate's made of carbon dioxide, right? It's, carbonate is chalk, right? It's what, what you used to write on blackboards before you had whiteboards, which I don't like. And the carbonate is um, what this is made of. But it's made from carbon dioxide, and now we know this whole system that interacts. So when we measured it, we were wondering, are these really biological? So when we 
measure the Martian meteorites, what you get out of it for measuring the oxygen using the trick that we understood from flying the rockets, we're able to sort out what happened over the course of a couple billion years on the Martian atmosphere. And it turns out Mars was mostly dry and the carbonate is coming from the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but not from life. So the carbonate that's in there that's reported to be life isn't. And the question, and you can please ask these questions afterwards too, is the question, does that mean that there's no life on Mars? And that's a different question, which I'll leave it as something to ask if you're interested. But of course, the most important thing on Mars is the issue of water and where it went. So I'm very interested in water on Mars. This is a carefully staged photograph my daughter gave me some time ago. For, she said, you should use this, Dad. Instead of your other stupid stuff, show them this. I'll remember this. All right. So, so we've learned a lot about Mars, how it works, what its evolution has been, but not enough to answer the obvious questions. There's still some ones out there. So we're on that border of understanding that in, in planetary systems. But, but the thing is, about thinking about these things, I was thinking about it, you know, that we were, talk, we were discussing earlier, and we were saying it's the interesting thing about the human intellect is it's just the things you can figure out, whether you're in medicine or law or history or, or physics, uh, the things that you can actually think about. That's pretty amazing all by itself. Just when you go in a library and you look at what people know, it's amazing. It's really, and it's fun just to go and cruise through it. So I thought I have to find a good quote for this. And I couldn't come up with a great quote, but it's actually a relevant quote. And I like this one. It's from Woody Allen. It's amazing to figure, we can figure things out like that when it's difficult enough to find your way through Chinatown. <laughs> and he's right, because I always get lost in Chinatown. And so, you know, we, we can think about the origin of the universe, but you get lost in Chinatown. So then we want to turn to oxygen. So this is another painting. This is in the New York Metropolitan Art Museum. It's on the top floor in the, in the big gallery. This is the guy, there's a, this is important historically. So just to show you I know some history, and this is going to probably be about the end of it, except for baseball history. This is Lavoisier, who discovered oxygen. The sign in the museum down here says that this is his wife. I've never been able to document this, but I don't, if I read their expressions, I don't think that's the case. But I'm good at, I'm good at making stories. Now, the historical part, that's part of it. So understanding oxygen, which is what I'm going to talk about, um, is Lavoisier played a really important role in the American Revolution because what he also figured out was how to make gunpowder, right? That it was dry and you could reload it and you, didn't have, and you could make bullets that were already loaded. And it was he that figured it out and told the people here in the Revolution how to do it and the British didn't know how to do it. So it was a major advantage when you're outnumbered as long as you can outfire it doesn't do it. So it was Lavoisier that figured it out with his, with his wife. So part of the story now, you want to go and get this record. And now we got the record over, starting. we started it about 12 billion years ago. Then we went to 4.5 billion years ago. Then we looked at Mars 1 or 2 billion years ago. Now what we'd like to do is look at slices of time and try to understand how a planet works at high resolution in time at the isotope level to see what we can figure out. But that means you need to get six-month record. So this is where you have to get into, to me, really bad stuff. Now you heard I went to the I went to school at the University of Miami. So the problem is where you want to do this. That's where you have to go, the South Pole. Now how do you? And I got a student to go with me for this little outing. Well, how do you get people to do this? Up in your library, I saw it when when we went on a tour. I saw a copy of a book by. Um, a guy named Shackleton he wrote a, a story called Endurance when he got trapped in the Antarctic and he had to get his men out and he got them all out. So the question is, how do you get someone to go with you? Well, I thought, all right, well, that Shackleton figured it out. And he ran an advertisement in a newspaper, and here it is. Men wandered for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful, honored in recognition in case of success. So that's what it is. 
Shackleton got it right, man. That was just that he's right. It's just that's how I see the place. So it's nice to get there. The the aircrafts are wonderful. Here's the accommodations. It's a happy time. There's no bathroom on this. It's a six-hour flight. You get to the Antarctic, and you have to fly from the pole across glaciers. It's five hours from, from the coast to get to the South Pole, which is at 10,000 feet. And here it is at 10,000 feet. This is our commercial. So here's the South Pole. Here's my student. Here's me. And this is where we spent six weeks in a tent. Like, like I said, there's 10,000 feet, so I forgot this part. It's at a high altitude. Everyone says, Mark, did you see any penguins? There's no damn penguins at the South Pole. It's 10,000 feet. There's nothing there. This is it. So we spent, we, so what we did was one, but the South Pole is a little dirty because there's people there, so it's not remote enough. So you have to go far out from the South Pole and find some place. So this is it. I have pictures in every direction, but this is what it is in every direction. <laughs> so it's, and it's time in a tent. Believe me, this is it's. And so this is very high tech. You saw the part of the rocket. You know, they say, well, okay, I'm sort of a rocket scientist. Well, here's how we do it here. This is not rocket science. I always told myself because I went to school in high school down in Southeast Virginia. I, most of the time, I worked for construction companies. I said I would do construction. I didn't do construction. I dug ditches. And I always said, man, I'm going to work so hard. I'm never going to go back to that again. Not to dig any more ditches because I do not like shovels. So here we are. So much for careful planning and education. Here I am digging, and here's what it gets. So this is where it gets really interesting. So in the end of the day, you get down. This is halfway down, and you get you get down. But the thing is, you can get a nice slice at six months of the time to go back in time. So that gets interesting. So we, my colleague in in San Diego, came up with a way to measure the isotope record oxygen and sulfur over time in this record. And we published it a year ago. And this is, I'm happy because everyone tells me, oh, well, we made the cover of science. We made the cover of nature. I said, no, you didn't. Your frog was on the cover. It's not you. It's no big deal. So what? Yeah, but it was my experiment. No, it's a frog. It's not your experiment. A frog is an animal. It's not your experiment. I said, I'll make the cover. So this is me on the cover, the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. I made the cover. So I'm so happy with this. And so, and they, know, they have a policy not to do it, and I know it because I'm an editor for the journal. I said, I, I know they're not going to do it, and, and not only that, since they know me, they'll, they'll dump all over me, so I have to find a way out. So I took this picture of myself, taking a picture of the globe at the South Pole, and this is, so this is a ceremony South Pole marker. So it was diffuse enough that it wasn't really a person, but it still made it, so I'm proud of it. So I wasn't proud of anything else, but this was a good trick. So what we found in part of this record is that climate, you see perturbations that happen where the Earth's atmosphere gets perturbed and it shows up at the South Pole. And two of them you expect. Pinatubo and Cerro El Chichon, you expect, right? They're volcanoes, they're stratospheric, it gets to the South Pole. That's no big news. Everyone's known that for a long time. That's how you tell your age on it. But also, at each of those times, there were volcanoes, and they were El Ninos. So this is important, because we're right now in, in the middle of an El Nino developing that may be one of the biggest in recorded history. It looks like it could, and I'll talk about this a little bit. But we didn't know which. But when we looked at it from this record, number one, at this time period, we are seeing the sulfate and the oxygen in that going up. But what it is, as it turns out, in 1998, for those of you who remember, you may remember that the equatorial regions were basically on fire. Indonesia, most of Indonesia was on fire. It was, I remember someone told me that they were teaching class in Indonesia and they had to cancel class. And it was because the students in the back couldn't see the blackboard because of the smoke in the, in the, in the rooms. And it's because after, after the El Nino phase, that, that was a record of... Bio, this is, that was a record of the burning. And so the, it's a fire index, and so it, it had a huge peak there. But in El Nino, the whole Pacific Ocean warms up, and in the phase after, it gets cold. So right now, we're in this period when the Pacific Ocean is warming, and then it gets cold, and when it gets cold, it's dry, and that's when it gets on fire. So that's what we're going to be looking at in a year and a half, and that's what the perturbation is. So the biggest perturbation to the atmosphere 
certainly in the last 2,000 years, was because of this. But the only way we know it is from what happened at the equator. And the only way you can happen what records at the equator was what you measure in the Antarctic. And the only way we know it in the Antarctic is from the trick we used on Mars. So it's a funny leap chain of events, but, but this record is a big perturbation to the climate of the atmosphere, and it's probably important in terms of trying to understand the whole cycle, the equator of the things are coming up during the fires and transporting through the atmosphere to the poles. And this is a whole part of the Earth system that no one knew about. So if you want to understand the total system of the planet, you have to understand this part. So the strange thing is, that's the, the Mark Twain, it's amazing what you can find out by finding out. The answer sometimes is in strange places. And so this led to asking a little bit more about this global climate system, because what's tied up in this is another issue. When you change the cycle, the water cycle changes. And whether you believe in climate warming or not doesn't, you know, I'm not even going to get into that, but it doesn't matter because one of the things that certainly is perturbed right now is the water system. I'm in California. You know this is serious business when people let their lawns start dying and putting in rock gardens. And when the governor has you only allowing certain days to water your lawn and people are replacing your lawns. I mean, my colleagues will tell you it's serious business. And it's, and it's not going to get better, it's going to get worse. So whatever's causing it is a problem. But there's a bigger problem that I'm interested in, which gets more down to a philosophical and a social part, and it's drinking water. So 65% of the world's population gets its water from this little stretch here, right? You've got the Brahmaputra, the Irrawaddy, the Ganges, the Yellow River, the Mekong, 65%, and if you go there, there's not, much, there's not much ice there. That goes away. All of China, India, Pakistan, Vietnam, they're out of water. That's a lot of people. Now, I don't do political science, but my own estimation would be there's probably going to be problems. And so the question is, is there anything that I can use in those tricks to understand what's going on here? So we've gone there, I've gone there twice, and the answer is the melting rate is faster than it should be. And we use the new trick in nuclear physics to figure this out from the radioactivity that we measure. But just so I show you that I'm gonna, how, what it takes to do these projects. Or you saw that stupid snow pit. The guy from Miami is in there digging it. So this you have to use very technical devices to get your samples in and out of Tibet. And it takes, an, it takes a good eye to figure this out. So here's our equipment. It's a standard one yak operation. You go up with the tent on the back and your equipment on your own back. And when you go to 21,000 feet, you know, you can't carry much stuff. So it's, here's a, so here's a picture at the top. This is at 20,000 feet. That's the top of the glacier. And sitting here, and it's the same thing. Looking at the snow pit to look at the record over time to see what's happening at the top of the glacier. And this is, I've been there twice, but I need to go back. I was going to go this year to Mount Everest on the, on the Tibetan side, which is where I'm working, but the earthquake wiped out all my equipment and my yak, and so now we're scheduled. We've set up across, the, I've set up stations across the Tibetan plateau, and I'll go back to 24,000 feet, I hope, in Mount Everest in May, and this is how we do it. You wear surgical garb because a little bit of contamination and your samples aren't any good. So we've learned a little bit about the system. And so now to, to, to get to the last end of it. So if you, if you want to understand the track, your, so we've got good tools here. Right? I haven't gone into, the, into what goes inside of the sausage, as they say. Um, but you can see how we, play, what, how we get the information about how the Earth and the whole system works over time and space. The whole thing. So now if you can go back in time on this origin of life, what do you measure and what do you get at? And, and this is a fun problem. My, my, my former colleague at UCSD and a good friend for until he died was a fellow named Stanley Miller. I'm sure you've all have heard of the Miller-Urey reaction. 
We talked nearly every day for decades. We shared a mailbox, and we'd end up at the mailbox at the same time, and we'd talk for an hour. And, and you have to solve the problems this. How much oxygen was there on the early Earth? And the problem, and I already said it in a simple way, the problem is it's water. Right, the water's like the, the giant etch-a-sketch. It erases everything, right? It weathers things down so you can't measure it. So it's hard. But we found a way to do it. And it turns out that the, the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere, it's actually simple, I'll do it this way. So you make oxygen. When you make oxygen, as soon as you make oxygen, you make ozone. You make ozone on Mars, right? You can see it from ground base. You do it spectroscopically. I can do it with my eye, but I'm a trained professional. But you can see ozone in the atmosphere of Mars. So it's there. So it's a good, ozone is a good recorder of, of oxygen levels. Once you make oxygen, if you have light, you make ozone. Poof, it's, it's, it's simple. Very simple chemistry. When you have ozone, it shields you from UV light, right? That's why we worry about skin cancer. It's why people like me, as, as my skin doctor says, I have to pay my... My every four months, I have to pay, pay my blonde-eyed, blue-eyed tax, and he freezes me with liquid nitrogen to burn off the stuff that leaks through the ozone layer, right? And I'm sure some of you have gone through this. $100 to get burned with liquid nitrogen. I do it to myself every day in the lab, and I pay this guy $100. And then he tells me that, that this will sting for a minute. It doesn't sting. It hurts. I don't know. So if those of you who are cosmologists are, and do that sort of cosmology, um, and skin doctors, you know, you have to change your words. Dentists, too. You know, this is a little pressure on your gum. It's not pressure. It, it hurts. It's a needle. But what we found was, what was I talking about? Okay, so, <laughs> so, so when the UV gets through, it does a funny photochemistry to sulfur. So it's, it's a record. And it shows up in the isotopes. We learned that on Mars. So if we look in the early Earth, if we see this funny fingerprint, if it's there... It's a record of the oxygen. So it turns out that it's right. When you go, here's today, and here's, here's the old rocks on Earth, the 3.8 billion. Before that, the Earth is getting piled on by meteor bombardment because the solar system's doing house cleaning. And everything's going into the sun, and if the Earth is in the way, well, as they say, whatever. It so the... The, the solid rock is all molten until that time. And then it starts to crystallize out. And these are records, here's today, where, the, where you have an ozone layer. So here is the ozone layer starting to come in and go out. So oxygen is starting to form. But the bottom line is, from this record, we can actually calculate how much oxygen was there. And the answer is, is at most, it was probably a thousand times less oxygen than there is now. People tried for 50 years to figure out how to do this. So for us and for people to do this for a living, in the origin of life, this is it. This is, as it's going on here, is it's coming and going. And by 2.2 billion years ago, it switched on. And the oxygen level is there. So for the first time, we've been able to track this. But it's this funny effect that we got on Mars which we learned about, which we thought about doing because of what we were doing, flying the rockets. So it seems like a, a weird stream of things, but there's a connection in trying to understand deeper in time and space what's going on. So the last minute of this is the last interesting part of the puzzle. This is the greatest mystery of all time. I love this story. And it's true. Usually you have to make stuff up to get people's interest, right? But this one's true. Right? That's what they do down the road here, isn't it? No, it's not. I'm, jo I'm joking. <laughs> um, see, I'm obviously not a politician. Otherwise, I'd be toast by now. Um, 650 million years ago, the Earth froze solid. And there's well-known reasons for that, but it froze solid. It just was in the wrong neighborhood at the wrong time, and the carbon dioxide got lost, and it froze. But here's the, part of the, here's the problem. Now, here's the interesting part. So here's the oldest rocks on Earth. And you look in the rocks, right? This isn't any theory or anything. You go to the fossil records. You can go down to the, the wall here and go to the Smithsonian. You've got a great exhibit of this through time. It's a fantastic exhibit, like all the Smithsonian stuff. And it's bacteria and archaea, stromatolites, little microscopic bugs. And that's all you have. They call this time period the boring billions. It's all there is. It's boring. It's like, it's like a chemistry faculty meeting. It's endless. 
And it kind of, don't repeat it. Yeah, they already know I think this. So, and then the Earth freezes solid 650 million years ago, but only for about a million years, right? And geologically, a million years of sediments like this much, it's nothing. And then it unfreezes in about 100,000 years, you know, like this, and it unfreezes. And then you look at the rocks, and everybody's there. Animals, plants, fungi, dinosaurs, they're all there. So just, so this is the thing. Just in this brief period of time, you, here's the rocks here and here's the rocks there. Nobody's here and everybody's here. And the only thing in between it is freezing the earth. So that's where we're putting all of our attention. So, I, you know, in my next phase of my life here, what part of what I do is work on this problem. And where you get the samples are in, the best ones are in China. And this is one of my former postdocs. He's now a professor at LSU. His last name is Bao, so he insists that we call him Chairman Bao. And he gave me, and we gave him, so Chairman Bao gave us this picture. So this, from here down, about two miles, is what's called diamictite. I'm not a geologist, but I've learned all this stuff, so I've got to show off my knowledge. And, and this is where you see all the algae and things. So this thin little layer of carbonate rock is that's what happened when the earth melted and all the CO2 came out and it precipitated down limestone. So this is the record. This is in the, in the River Gorge region of China. If you've been there before, it's a great region. And he had to stay in China for four years longer than he thought because of some events in Tiananmen. And so he ended up being a, working for the Chinese Geologic Survey and, out, and mapping out this area. So he, what he had learned in there, he took me over and taught me. And uh, so I learned in the field in that region because he learned it. Um, and then above here are all the fossils. So you can go. You know, you go here, it's just all plant. It's archaea. And up here, it's fossils. You know, it's lizards and whatnot, you know, and all these biological sorts of things that I don't know what they are. And it happens just in this little sliver of time. So it's a great mystery. And that's, that's what we're working with is try to, to solve that. So in conclusion, you know, you sort of see how we look at these problems. And they're all sorts of, they're big problems, but you can learn a lot by applying tools. Ours isn't the only tool. But I like this Chinese proverb. I thought it's, a, it's a, one of my favorites. It's not, I thought it was Confucius, but I looked into it. It's just, it's, a Chinese, it's just a Chinese proverb. If you want to do your job well, you have to sharpen your tools first. And that's right. If you can make your tools sharper, in my case, it's getting down a little lower, which is at the isotope level, which helps you dissect things. And it's a sharpening of the tool. It's true forever. Whatever you do, whatever you're interested in, if you can learn more about a technique, whether it's studying art or whatever, if you get it better, it's, it, you can do things better. So I have one last slide, and it's a tip. So everything you learned was old school, but now I've learned a new way to do it. This, this digging ice, and it, it was spot, and it's because, of the, it's because of the Antarctic. I don't want to go back. It's cold. I'm from Miami. I'm not going back. So you have to find a way to change, find a record in time and space. So I figured out a way to do it. And the only way to do it is what we're supposed to have by now anyway. And that's simple. It's time travel. So this is my first experiment. This is actually in a cistern in Masada in Israel. So this is my first, this is my first exploration in, into into time travel, and you can see I'm beaming up here much as in Star Trek. So, I thought tonight would be appropriate that I'm not actually here. <laughs> I'm sitting in Sloppy Joe's Bar and Grill in Key West, Florida, live and direct by a hologram. So thank you for allowing me to come here, and I eat my dinner also by a hologram. But it's been a pleasure to be here, and any questions you have, I'm happy to answer anything you want. And thank you for inviting me. Larry, thank you very much. I'm not sure I'm here either, but <laughs> thank you, Mark. We have time sure. for some questions. There are some microphone runners in the room. So when the microphone comes to you, please stand so that everybody can see you. Tell us your name and tell us whether you're a member of the society or a guest. There's no penalty for being a member of the society, and there's no penalty for being a guest. Please try to keep your hands up so the runners will see you. 
and they and, will bring the microphone make them easy over. Too. Hello, hi. My name's Tony Lopez. I'm not a member of the society, but I found you on this thing called the internet. It's been great. Um, thank you very much for a wonderful sure. view of synthesis of a variety of subfields. Um, to push it to another subfield, to, can anything that you've spoken about tonight be used in looking for um, life or atmospheric conditions on exoplanets outside of our solar system? Yeah, I'm sort of a voyeur in that field. And, and, and not, the, answer, the short answer is no. What I do is, I, I, can't, I don't do that sort of spectroscopy, but I follow it religiously. They're really close. And, and, and then the question is going to be, what do you look for? See, if you see the ozone signal and you see nitrous oxide, then you've really got a fingerprint. See, for me, nitrous oxide, that's my choice molecule. Because N2O, laughing gas, right? Laughing gas is made by the kind of bacteria that's the first life on Earth. All right, and, and you can't make it by very many ways either. You can make it industrially, but, but it's, it's an agent that usually is only made biologically. So it's a really good fingerprint, and, it, and it's one of these molecules that lights up in the infrared. So they're getting, they can't do it yet, but it'll happen. I can't say what the timeline is. So if they can see things like that in some combination of things, then you'll be able to answer the question, is there life on the exo planet? So I don't, I don't do it. I wish I did. I, I'd love to get into it, but I don't do it. It's a good question, too, actually. Who has the mic? I have one. Well, I have one, too. OK, there we go. I'll ask you a question. Runners, get the mic to the people who have their hands up. There's, there's a gentleman right here. Please. Oh, Carl. Carl Merrill, I'm a member of the society. One thing you didn't touch on, but given your technology, maybe you can make a comment. And that is the C14, C13 ratio, which of course went up during our atomic bomb testing. But what really interests me is that there was a peak 730 years ago. And whether you have any speculations as to what caused that. Well, I don't know, but I'm happy to speculate. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the carbon-14 is made by the, by the interaction of high energy particles in the top of the atmosphere. And those get modulated by solar activity. So if there was a change in the, the geomagnetic field, you could you get essentially a bump in the field that way. Um, so that, that would do it. But I don't know of any other thing that did it. So I don't know the answer, but it's not, um, it's not impossible that something would happen like that. You see the 11-year cycle in the carbon-14 production because of the sunspot changing. And so the cosmic rays are modulated, right? And so if, if you change the modulation or during... Um, polar shift, you know, when the, when the Earth's magnetic fields change, you can see a change in the isotope production of things like beryllium and boron, because when the magnet goes from north to south, there's this little in-between time when there's not much magnetic field, and everybody gets lost. And, um, and at that time, you don't have the shield against the cosmic rays coming in, right? And so you can see an up, a goosing up of the production rate. So something like that could do it, but I don't know the real answer. Yeah, it's hard to do because the gamma rays don't make, they don't do spallation. They don't make the, the isotopes. They mess up the chemistry, but it doesn't have enough energy to, it's, it's short by about a factor of 100 because you need like 100 million electron volts of a particle and it's, and it's a energy. Yeah, I thought about that part for looking for old traces of supernova, but it won't do it. It's a good question. Hi, I'm Kirby Runyon. I'm, I am a member of the PSW. Very enjoyable talk. Thank you. And I was wondering if you had a status update on the Genesis sample return and how you mitigated against terrestrial contamination since the shoot didn't open. Oh, man, that's a bad question. Why did you have to run that? Shit, he's one of yours, Larry. Yeah. Well, you're not supposed to bring up the schmutz part. <laughs> uh, Mark, you should be aware that he works with uh, JPL. What? No, prize physical. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. Well, it's not as bad as you think, because what it is, is the solar wind is implanted in a surface, but it's implanted, it's coming out of the sun with a lot of energy. It's, it's the sort of energy we we're, we were just saying. So it implants really deep. You know, when you look at moon rocks, you can see these tracks, because it goes in really deep. So essentially, part of it is you can chemically clean it, and you don't, you're not bothering the solar wind that's implanted as an atom. But the other thing is, what we do is that laser that I have, you can steer it. 
and program it. So it basically is like a Gillette Blue, you know, where you can shave off the surface down to before you get to the solar wind. We can do that. But it took us a year and a half to figure out that trick, which we didn't have to do thanks to the people that wired it, switching backwards. <laughs> but we can clean it. And we're ready to measure it. We, we had a proof that we can measure something that small and reproducibly, and we did it. It took five years to build that machine. And so we can do it, and we've done it all, and so I've got the request, and the samples are archived at the Johnson Space Center. And so I hope we get it. You know, but we can do the measurements now. And I want to get it out of the way, actually, because well, now that I can measure things really small, there's this whole range of new problems to do on other things that I want to get into. So I want to get this out of the way. But yeah, it was hard to learn how to clean it. Thank you for asking. <laughs> it took a year and a half. Okay. Uh, my name is Stuart Sweet. I'm a member of the Society retroactively because I always pay my dues late. <laughs> Uh, so you said we could ask you anything, so I'm going to. Uh, what do you think of Elon Musk's idea of terraforming Mars by throwing a few thermonuclear bombs at the, at the planet to raise the CO2 level? Yeah, but you tell me water. Well, I, I thought the idea was to raise the temperature of the planet as perhaps a precursor to uh, humans getting there and making it a little easier to survive. Yeah, well, okay, I don't know about the thermonuclear part. That sounds sort of fun to do, but it's... <laughs> but... But, but it's an interesting question, but the, at the end of the day, it's always the same problem. You've got to have water, and there's no water on Mars. You know, the polar ice caps, are, it's ice, but it's not water ice. It's CO2 ice, right? So you can, you can blow that up, and you've got your carbon dioxide, but you've got to get the water. And the problem with terraforming is you've got to schlep it from Earth then, and you've got this giant gravitational well to get out of it. The only way to do the Mars thing, and then you wouldn't have to, you know, the... The, the Mars thing is that you've got to make water somehow. You've got to convert hydrogen. You need a source of hydrogen. And that's always the problem with terraforming. It's a good question. I've actually worried about this a lot. Since I like the idea of it. But you, you're stuck with the darn water problem. You can't do anything without water. and You can't bring it there. And there's not enough there. There's actually probably more water on the moon than there is on Mars. But it's like a part per million. Ten parts per million water. It's compared to, cent, you know, you're like... 10,000 times too low to be able to do anything. So you got to find a chemical way to make the water, and then you can tear up, you know, warm it with CO2 or whatever. But the problem with CO2 is you make everything acidic. If you make your atmosphere too thick with CO2, then you make carbonic acid, in it. And, that, and that's hard for the plant. That's the problem with the ocean acidification, right, is that the CO2 levels goes up and you, you lower the pH of the ocean. That's why you've got these dead zones off of, off of, Oregon, it's because of the acidity. So you'd, you'd run into that problem, too. But the real problem is the water. You have to solve that one first. You need a source. It's a really interesting problem. I like it. There's probably better ways to do it, but it'll be... You probably have to... My own idea... So you asked me this question. So you, <laughs> you shouldn't have gotten me started. You could do it in spacecraft first, like Jerry O'Neill's old idea of the high frontier. You know, because then you can take your water up in pieces and practice in a space platform, build it out, learn how to do things in a controlled environment, and then tackle the surface of a planet. It's easier to do the moon first, that's my own opinion, just because gravity is easier and it's closer. And uh, Mars is just too far away to do as the next step. Then you could do it on, on, on the moon, but you could do it with a enclosed environment, and that's not an impossible problem either. And then you, you could build the greenhouse in and use the solar radiation to do it. But you've got to get the water there. So you'll have to schlep it in the beginning. And, and the moon is a better place. First is place for them. That's, that's my own opinion. I'm not an expert on this, but that's my own opinion. It's a good question, though. I love that stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have a, a, a question and a comment. Uh, the question is uh, sorry. Uh, whether uh, you could comment on the role of methane in keeping the Earth warm during this so-called uh, snowball Earth. And the comment is to put in a plug uh, for uh, absorption band of ozone at 300 nanometers, which saturates uh, yeah. at one one-hundredth of the abundance of oxygen, too. Yeah. And uh, so it's by far the most sensitive 
a marker of oxygen on an exoplanet. I agree with you 100%. And your name and are you a member? How about the question? It, say, repeat it again. I got. I was okay. thinking of the ozone, and I was picturing um, a spectrum. You and I didn't lost mention uh, when you talked about the snowball Earth. You never mentioned methane. Oh. And uh, people like Jim Casting have yeah. mentioned that this is a possible solution. And so I was wondering wh um, what you thought about that. Well, that's a good point. That's a very good point. And Jim's Jim has some models for the arche for the early Earth for the work that we did. He modeled our results. For that, and methane's an important player. Methane's a greenhouse gas, and so when you want to pull out of the out of the snowball period, methane's a good player because it's got a, it likes to absorb heat, right? It's got a it's a good property for doing it. The, but the thing is, you know, you're going it could be a player, but when you've got the carbonate layer, you know that you have to put down enough carbon dioxide to account for the layer there. So if you count up how much carbonate rock is there, put it back in the atmosphere of CO2. The amount of CO2 levels, just to make the rock that you see there, was probably about a, a hundred to a thousand times what it is now. So you probably had plenty of CO2, but you probably had methane. I'm thinking as you're, I'm, I'm answering this. There is some, and there's good evidence for that in the carbon isotope record that, that, that shows up at the same time period, that it looks like there is some organic carbon, and it probably did come out as methane. Whether it was from volcano or biology is a little tricky. But methane's probably part of it, in terms of the melting. But the problem is what it does after the melt it, you know, that you get all the life there. Methane is a good one for a biomolecule. So if you want to go forward with that, it's, methane's probably going to be important. But no one's looked into the details of that part of it. That's the next place. That's the wall. Right, that's where we are now, is to answer your question satisfactory. You'd have to invite me back, like, in four years. And you probably have an answer that you'd walk away and say, yeah, that was a good answer. But for now, you know, it's, it's probably a player, but it's hard to say. It's a good question. My name is Rudolf A. Krutar. I am a member of the Society. Uh, your description of the uh, process of discovery reminded me of something that happened to me on July 19th. I'd been cleaning out my crawl space and pulled out 10,000 empty soda cans, cleaned them, and then I decided to clean half a dozen more and I tossed them in the water. One of them stood upright on top of the water. So God showed me one can walk on water. Okay? I figured it, All right. I figured out why. Ask a question. I figured out why. Down. Okay, I will. I figured out why and I put two cans there and when they came together, clunk, they, they uh, stuck together and danced on the water. You ripple the water, touch the water, and uh, and they will dance. And uh, so my question is: When God shows you something funny, should you laugh? No, no, you never laugh. When you see something unusual like that, then you. No, that's the best part about being able to think about things. You say, you say, well, that's weird, and you say, but what, what did it? You know, so there's a cause for it. Yeah, and that's when, even if you don't figure it out, it doesn't matter. You always discover something else or learn more by, by, by ant, trying to figure it out. I, I had a, went to Caltech once a long time ago and, and had a discussion on, with uh, Richard Feynman. And what he said was, uh, you're talking about teaching freshmen. And, that, and, and he's teaching physics. And he said that when they asked him questions, never learned anything from teaching physics. But when the students would ask them questions in the same way that you're observing something, the process of thinking about it leads you to discover something. Even if you don't answer the question, you learn something. So it's good. You know, you, there's always something you discover on the way. It's like going to a new city and you decide, I always decide, I need to buy this or so. I'm in Prague. I've got to buy some crystal. So I go looking for a crystal store. I never find it, but along the way, I'll find some other interesting store or something, or some new plaza. So just thinking about it, you'll learn something anyway. No, I never laugh. But I take it seriously. I never figure things out, but, it's, but you learn a lot in doing it. Question back there? That's yeah. a lot of cans, too, by the way. <laughs> yes, my name is Bradley Skates, and I'm a guest. And I had a question about a graph you had near the end of the oxygen levels over the course of Earth, where it was like, Virtually flat from one percent until they hit a, the 
first three billion years or so, and then it sharply spikes up. But during that time period, there were bacteria there. Some of those guys had been photosynthetic, so why didn't the oxygen level gradually creep up with something absorbing it? Or what was going on? Here's the short answer. Don't know. Okay. That's a really good question. It, there's, I don't know. Look, let, so, so now I'll just speculate. And what we're, sort of where it is is that it's coming and going, it looks like, but it just doesn't catch. You know, it's like in the old days when you have a power mower or, or an oven root, you know, and you're pulling on it. It doesn't quite catch. It's like that. And it won't, won't turn over. And it just doesn't have enough of something. But it's not enough to take off. Because if you look at most, gro most growth curves of anything, you know, they sort of do this, right? And there's, and, but what causes it? Sometimes it's a nutrient. Sometimes it's temperature. Usually it's a nutrient. So, but we don't know. But now we've seen where it takes off. So you can test things like your question, like is it a nutrient? You can look and see if that some key nutrient is there. Metals are important in this game. And it may one of my, my favorite theories to think about now is you need to have energy going and, and, and conversion of, of electrons, what you make things go, photochemically. No one's really looked into the role of of what happens with the photoelectrons in, in a process to drive the chemistry. And that goes differently for quantum mechanical reasons than ice. So it may be that some of the energy spike has occurred with alignment of, of, of the surfaces with, a, with a making it essentially like a photocell for energy transfer reactions. So, I, you know, it's all completely open. It's a, it's, a, it's a hard question to answer. There is no answer right now. Or if there is, we don't know if it's right. And one more question, if there's another question. Right here, Al Ehrlich up in the front. <laughs> uh, this is really just a matter of curiosity. When you talked about the Earth freezing over, were you talking about the notion, which I thought was no longer in fashion, of snowball Earth? Yeah where it freezes over and the only thing that saved it from perpetual frost was volcanoes coming through and putting dirt on the surface so it would absorb. Yeah, that's I thought that had been discarded. No, no, no. What, yeah, here's what it is. I know what you're saying. Where they argue now, so, so it's a fine point, whether it's a snowball or a slush ball is what they're arguing about. So the slush ball, people say the snowball is dead. because But what it really is, there's a paper... The week before I came here, wherever the heck I was, I was reading it in science, and, and what it is is that because of the orbital characteristics of the Earth, the glacier comes down, but instead of covering the whole Earth, there's an advance and a retreat. So the ice is there, but they look at it more rather than a total Earth freeze over. It's coming down very deep into the tropics, but there's some retreating as the, as the precession of the, the Earth changes, and it and it warms, but it's still mostly frozen over. So when they say it's discarded, yeah, you're right. The, what the people that look, believe in a total snowball, you know, they'll say, yeah, it's a snowball, and the others will say, no, it's not, because they have their own name for it, and it's slightly different from it. So, but the whole idea, the freezing's there, because you can see the, the carbonate layer, right? The smoking gun is there, it's, and that's the layer from, the, from all the CO2 being trapped in the ice. Thank you. Yeah, it's, thanks. Well, thank you, Mark. Sure. Before you go, I'd like to present you with a token of our appreciation, which is a framed copy of the announcement of your talk uh, signed by all the members of the General Committee on behalf of uh, the PSW membership. Thanks, Larry. Thank Appreciate you, Mark. Thank you very much. That's cool. That's nice. Appreciate it. Just turn your mic on.